Welcome to our first, uh, I guess, uh, lecture that's really about content here. Um, before we, we move on here, I just want to um, say that I, I think I'm going to start posting these lectures on YouTube. I'm going to try to at least because I think it's a bit more of a stable platform. But just so you know, um, what that means is we have 10 minute limits on the videos that we can post on YouTube. So some of these lectures are going to have to be cut off at 10 minutes and then you're going to have to go to another one because I doubt we're going to be able to get most of these lectures in within 10 minutes. So they're going to be split up into a couple of different videos and under the external links section on your Blackboard, I'll just post both links to um, uh, to both lectures and you'll just watch one after the other. And I'll make sure that I'm very clear about which comes first and which comes second. So what are we going to be talking about today? Well, this is a class on theories and principles of human communication. So it seems to me that a reasonable place to start is to start talking about what is theory, since it's going to undergird most of what we talk about throughout the class. Actually, not most of it, all of it. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the way that we're going to be using the idea of theory within this class. And then we're going to also talk about a breakdown in theory. We're going to talk about the breakdown between interpretive and objective theory. Now, both, this is a really important concept, and I know I mentioned it in the other lecture as well, but it's important that you take notes on these as well, um, because come exam time, you're going to want to have those notes available to you, and it's not going to be easy to go find um, uh, find these links. I'll, I'll take them down actually close when it comes close to exam time. So um, make sure that you that you uh, that you write this stuff down. Um, all right. So what we're going to start off by talking about here is what is theory. When you think of the word theory, um, if we were in a face-to-face -face setting right now, I'd be asking you what are some common words that you associate with this theory. And the kind of answers that I usually get in class are things like, um, you know, we think about academics doing theory, or we think about, you know, really smart people do theory. Um, and so if you tell your parents, for example, that you're going to college and you want to study theory, for example, you're likely to be met with a kind of um, maybe a little bit of resistance, right? They may wonder how is this going to help you in your everyday life. It sounds a little highfalutin sometimes, like something that scholars do up in the ivory tower that doesn't intersect with the way that we run our lives all the time. So, what we're going to be the way that we're going to be framing theory in here is going to be something very different than that. We're going to take kind of as our um, as our MO here, understanding theory as a story, right? A way that helps us make sense of some kind of phenomenon. So if you think of the ways that you've heard theory may be used in the past, right? Like you may have heard of the theory of evolution, or you may have heard of the theory of relativity, um, right? Or you may have heard Freud's theory of the mind. What we have going on here when we use it in this way is these are simply kind of stories that help us understand what something is doing, right? And so when we talk about something like the theory of evolution, what we do is we have all this, um, this information that's out there, right? A bunch of different things that we can pull in, right? DNA records, fossil records, geological records. Um, and what we do is uh, we take one kind of way to make sense of the whole of that, right? It's a story, a story that helps us put all this information together into some kind of coherent, um, uh, I guess, thought process, right? And so what we're able to do is we're able to have a starting point and an ending point when we do that. Now, we can think about theory. One common way that theory is often used is that we talk about the difference between a theory and a fact, right? So when you get an argument with someone and you, and you tell them that um, right, you think what they did was idiotic, they might say, well, that's your theory, right? And what that means is usually that people are saying that it means that right, that's not proven. That's not a fact. When we use theory in an academic sense, that's really not what we're talking about. Theory and fact are not opposites when we talk about this, right? Um, theory isn't something that's unproven. We also talk about the theory of gravity, for example, right? Which, once again, is just a comprehensive story that takes into account things like orbits of planets, why things fall to the ground, right? R like air, rate of... Um, a uh, rate of like dropping, right? What it, what it is is that we're taking all this and putting it together into one kind of comprehensive story. 
Now, that doesn't mean that gravity isn't proven, for example. Right? It doesn't mean that it's not a fact. What it, what it means simply is that it's kind of a holistic way of looking at something. And theories are constantly in flux, too. They're always being revised as we get new information in. Often that's what we try to do with theories as academics, is you try to find information that pokes holes in the existing theory so that the theory can be tightened and can be understood a little bit better. You can kind of think about it almost like a model, right? Um, a theory might be something similar to um, kind of an idealistic way to use it. So if we use the term model, right, there's a couple different ways we might use it, right? We might talk about a model student, for example. And a model student is someone who is the exemplar, who is the mold that should be copied, right? So a model student is someone who always takes notes, always comes to class, always on time, always talks in class, etc. Or you might have a model on a runway. And the reason that we use models on runways is because those are supposed to be, right, I'm putting it in, in quotes here, um, right, they're supposed to be uh, the appropriate body type, right, that clothes are, you model them, right, this is what you're supposed to look like. Or we can talk about a model in a sense of, like, a model of a building that an architect might use. Now, that is a really, the model is a really important way to understand what theory does because we understand things in kind of an abstract sense. They're kind of out there. Not that it doesn't intersect with our everyday lives, but a theory could be thought of as kind of like an exemplar, right? Um, when removed from the quote unquote real world, we can understand how something is supposed to work, how something might look, right? And those are really valuable. So when an architect needs to build a skyscraper, he or she is not just going to start from the ground and say, all right, well, let's put some bricks here and let's put some, um, let's put a foundation over here. Let's see how this thing comes together as we go along. Um, that is a skyscraper that's doomed to fail. Instead, what an architect would do is they would build a model. They would build a perfect version of it on a smaller down scale so they can understand how to actually put this together, right? How we're going to have this intersect with the brick layers who are going to be laying the bricks, right? Um, where we're going to put windows, um, right? Everybody who's involved is going to work off of this kind of ideal, off of this um, idealistic prototype, right? The perfect of what this thing might look like. So a theory, what we're going to be doing here is going to take a phenomenon like communication and work to provide a story to make sense of it. I teach this class as a, as a survey, which means that we're going to be covering a lot of different theories throughout the semester. Rather than go really in depth about any of these theories, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a bunch of them. And we're going to get a bunch of different stories about what communication is. Much like we might build a bunch of different models of a skyscraper before we actually uh, try to erect the, the real thing, um, we're going to do something in here like this, right? We're going to look at a bunch of different stories that tell us what communication is. And these stories should help us kind of make sense of it, understand uh, what's going on when, when it is that we communicate. Now, it's important. I really want to stress this because theory is about engaging everyday life. Theory is not something that's out there that you um, right, aren't going to be able to incorporate into the way that you live your life. Now, I have a journal assignment for this class as well where I'm asking you to please keep track of how these theories intersect with your everyday life, right? How it is that you engage these. Because the things we're going to be talking about in here are things that you live, things you experience in your body. One metaphor that I really like and I think is very useful for understanding theory is to think of theories like maps. Now, a map, right, we can draw a different kind of maps for the same terrain, right? So I could look at the city of Spartanburg and say, I'm going to draw a map of Spartanburg. And so if I were to do that, I might include a bunch of different things, right? Let's talk about, like, I'm going to put the beacon on there. I would put Main Street. I would put the mall. I would put the courthouse, right, city hall, right? a bunch of different things that I would put on there. Now, that map would be useful for some things, right? If I wanted to show someone what the important landmarks in Spartanburg are, that map would be perfectly suitable. But that's not the only map that I can draw of that specific terrain. There's a lot of different maps that I could draw. I could draw an elevation map, right? I could draw a population density map. I could draw a road map. I could draw a map of the sewer system. Which of these maps are right? Well, that doesn't really make sense to even ask that question because 
how we determine whether or not a map is right is what that we actually want to use it for. Now I'm going to cut this off at this point because we're almost at 10 minutes. Uh, click on the next video and uh, we'll continue this discussion of theories and maps.